Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning, whether you're worshipping here in the church or in the hall or online. If you're at home, our service begins on page 101. The Lord be with you. And also with you. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6, we read, Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. And in Psalm 96, verse 9, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness, tremble before him all the earth. Just have a couple of quick announcements this morning. First of all, the flower list is available both in the church and in the hall if you wish to donate flowers for the beauty of our church. Also, just a reminder, if you're booking seats, either for the church or for the hall, please contact Caroline uh, anytime Monday to Friday between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Just to let you know that Peggy Flynn separated her 95th birthday yesterday. There's a birthday card in the church if you'd like to sign it if you haven't already done so. And finally, I'd like to say a thank you to Susan, who uh, both last week and this week is leading us with the singing. So we stand and sing our first hymn, hymn number 134, Make Way, Make Way for the Christ the King. Would you please stand? <laughs> and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins 
and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us pray. <coughs> and before we confess our sins as a congregation, let us in a moment of quietness bring before God our own sin. So let us pray. Almighty God, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in the unity of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins, and serve you with a quiet mind, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. First reading this morning is taken from the second book of Samuel, chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the Ark. They sent the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, systems, and cymbals. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. And after he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We shall start now and say the appointed psalm, which is psalm number 24, the congregation all saying the refrain. You please stand. The Lord of hosts, he, he is, is the King, King of glory. glory. The earth is the Lord's, and all that fills it, the compass of the world and all who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas, and set it firm upon the rivers of the deep. The, the Lord, Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, or who can rise up in this holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up their soul to an idol, or sworn an oath to a lie. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord, a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, 
of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up to everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord who is mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up to everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. O Lord of hosts, purify our hearts, that the King of glory may come in, your Son, Jesus our Redeemer. Let us pray. May the Lord now be in all our hearts and upon my lips, that every thought and word may be holy for the honour and glory of his name. Amen. A young police officer was taking his final exam for the police academy down in Garnerville and he was sent the following problem to solve. You are on patrol in the outer city where an explosion occurs in a gas main in a nearby street. On investigation, you find that a large hole has been blown in the footpath and there is an overturned van nearby. Inside the van, there is a small smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. You recognise the woman as the wife of your chief constable, who is at present in the United States of America on a lecturing tour. A passing motorist stops to offer you assistance, and you realise that he is a man who is wanted for armed robbery. And suddenly a man bursts out of a nearby house shouting that his wife is expecting a baby, and that the shock of the explosion has now made the birth imminent. Another man is crying for help, having been blown into the Jason Canal by the explosion, and he cannot swim. So describe in a few words what actions you would take. Well, the young constable thought for a moment, picked up his pen and wrote, I would take off my uniform and mingle with the crowd. But just as that wouldn't do for the policeman, so we as Christians can't duck our responsibilities either. We are often called to swim against the tide of public opinion. And Jesus certainly did. And so did the subject of our Bible reading this morning, John the Baptist. And interesting, all four of the Gospels tell us things about the life of John the Baptist. And our Gospel reading which I'm now going to read to you now, is from uh, Mark chapter 9 and verse 64. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. And some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. And others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheld, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had been bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. And when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. And finally the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, 
she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for anything that you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. And at once the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to wring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On a hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And as I was preparing this sermon, I was thinking about John the Baptist, and I wondered what life would be like in our parish if the bishop had instituted John the Baptist rather than Nicholas as rector of MacGregor. Can you imagine, for example, inviting John the Baptist around for dinner? What would you expect? So let's take a look. First of all, what would he be wearing? He certainly wouldn't have turned up in a Romani suit and a Roth Lauren shirt. What you have got is a rugged man with a slightly dishevelled look. And if we were honest, he'd probably look more like a local gypsy than the new rector. And what about his diet? If you asked him if he had any dietary requirements, he would probably tell you that he's vegetarian. And then he would probably say, actually, I only eat locusts and honey in the summer season. That would be enough to drive any same hostess up the wall. I ask you, where can you get locusts at this time of the year? Certainly not in Tesco's or any of the other supermarkets. Has he any diplomacy? But John the Baptist would not have been a prime candidate for the Foreign Office. He was not diplomatic enough. He called a spade, a spade. And what would his conversation consist of? I wonder what this topic of conversation would be with you over the dinner table. John the Baptist had few social graces. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out to look at his work, did he welcome them as honourable persons of the religious establishment? Did he smile and exchange pleasantries over breakfast? Did he try to engage him in polite conversation about their work? Did he ask him for their own perspective on the Messiah? Did he meet with them at the World Council of Churches to further interfaith dialogue? No, but he did call them a bunch of poisonous snakes that were soon to be consumed by the flames of hell. Not the way to make friends or influence people, is it? Not only did he alienate the religious leaders, but we read in this morning's Gospel reading that he fell out with King Herod himself. John was a prophetic voice calling the people back to their commitment to God. He told Herod that he was committing adultery by marrying his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and that he should stop. And that eventually cost him his head. But John didn't care for the good and the great in the land. He cared only for the things of God. Could you imagine his first Christmas sermon here in MacMagall, with a full church and a full overflow down the hall, while those who are at home would be, by, would be fighting for the best seats in their house as they tuned in to watch on Facebook and YouTube? What do you think his message would have been? Would it have been a platitude about somebody going on and being leaving and being loving to one another? Or would he have called us to repent and seek the things of God? I tend to think it's the latter. John the Baptist was not a conformer. 
Obviously, someone had forgotten to give him the book, How to Make Friends and Influence People for Christmas. The world here in which we live demands conformity. It demands that we live, that we think, and that we act just like everybody else. Those who have the courage to resist may face great opposition and ostracism in their life. A great American poet once said, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it's because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music that he hears, however measured and far away it is. Do you hear a different drummer? When John the Baptist did, it's essential that we listen to the voice of God inside of us. And as St. Paul said, we are called not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, so we may discern what is the will of God. So what was John the Baptist's mission? Well, St. Mark tells us that John's mission was to preach a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And that would have been shocking to the religious Jews of the day. The only time that baptism was used was when a Gentile became a Jew, and then he would baptize himself, and then all their family. But here we read that John the Baptist baptized them as if they were Gentile dogs, to use a first century Jewish expression. But wasn't that the message? In God's sight, their actions were beyond the pale, because God has absolute standards. Remember what Jesus said about the absolute standards of God in verse 28 of the fifth chapter of St. Matthew. If you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. God has high standards. Even our thoughts count. Our thoughts are no longer free. The local people loved John the Baptist because he walked the talk. He practiced what he preached. And this is what Jesus said about John the Baptist. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. We might think that John the Baptist was over the top, but Jesus took John seriously. And if we are Jesus' followers, we would do well to heed John's message too. Jesus himself said that the church's mission is to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name to all nations. And it's the same message that John the Baptist preached. John's mission can be summed up by the three R's. Firstly, recognising our own sin. Secondly, receiving God's forgiveness. And thirdly, reforming our life. If John's mission is going to impact us, if we are going to swim against the tide, we need to heed John's call and to live a life totally dedicated to God. John was prepared to give up the nice things in this world, to gain the accolade from his heavenly master. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. John the Baptist's story reminds us that being a Christian will not always be easy. There will be tough decisions to make that might lead us to be unpopular. Yet the story of John is not given to us to show us a way to earn our salvation, because we can't. All of us still have to come through the cross to Jesus. Even John the Baptist, a great and godly man as he was, could only enter the kingdom to the cross of Jesus Christ. For the kingdom of God is made up, not of those who in their own goodness try to enter it, but of those who are clothed in the blood of Jesus. For on human terms, John was special, but this needs to be in, kept in perspective. As Jesus said, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, Yet the very least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. However, once we are saved, 
John was a great example for us to follow, to follow in Christian living. But John's life reminds us that we must have integrity in our lives. We must be willing, we must be faithful to God's calling in our lives, even if it eventually costs us our head. And that is quite a challenge. Amen. Let us pray. Living God, may the experience of your love, the reality of your grace and the knowledge of your constant presence continue to transform our lives each day so we may live and work for you more faithfully to the glory of your name. Amen. Stand now and sing our next hymn, hymn number 642. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, Our Father the Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and grant her government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness, and, and let your servants shine for joy. O Lord, save your people, and bless those who you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and let your glory be over all the earth. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and renew us by your Holy Spirit. And the colic for the day. Sixth Sunday after Trinity. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we say together the first and the second colleague of the morning. O God, o God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you with eternal life and to serve you with perfect freedom, defend us in all the assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, o Lord our, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and ever-living God, we give you thanks for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger, and in all things guide us to know and do your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue in prayer. To God the Father who created the world, to God the Son who redeemed the world, to God the Holy Spirit who sustains the world, be all praise and glory, now and forever. Everlasting God, we pray that all who come into our church may be enabled to renew their relationship with you and may find in you rest, peace, strength, grace, and most of all, your abiding presence. Help us as a congregation to be outward looking that through our fellowship we may share our faith and the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, with those who we love and live amongst. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for the people of our world who are less fortunate than we are, especially those who live in the third world in countries where there is very little governmental stability and in countries where there is drought or famine. Help us to remember those who are weary with a relentless struggle to keep alive for those who can never look forward to a good meal and a comfortable bed and those who barely have the necessities of life, much less so many material luxuries which she often take for granted. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father God, may the needs of our families, our friends and our neighbours 
be made clear for us today, and we find that in our giving to them, we grow closer to you. We thank you for those whose work sustains our community, for all who create wealth and jobs, for those who grow and provide our food, for those who day and night maintain public services, for the police and the hospital services, for our hospitals, our doctors, our nurses, our surgeons, and all the ancillary staff. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Healing God, we raise before you those who are sick. We ask that you will ease their pain and heal the damage done to them in body, mind, or spirit. Be present with them through the support of friends and in the care of doctors and nurses. Fill them with the warmth of your love, now and always. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, we remember with thanksgiving those whom we love and have gone before us. We pray for those who have been recently bereaved, that they might find strength and comfort in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And let us in a moment of silence bring before God those things which are bothering us. Faithful God, we dedicate all these people and petitions to your loving care. Give us the strength and courage to walk alongside those in need, to fight for justice for the oppressed, and to allow others to see you in us and in all that we do in the coming week. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Sam, I am singing a final hymn, hymn number 94. In the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and we shall be omitting verses 2, 3, and 6. Hymn 94.
the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.